The execution of Louis XVI marks ultimate victory for the revolutionaries. A pivotal moment when a young nation, the French Republic, is literally born in blood. By the end of 1792, the radical Jacobins, believing the young revolution is in danger of being sabotaged by traitors, are steering the revolution with more and more violent means. But the Girondins, representing the people of the French countryside, want to slow the ascending violence for fear it will lead to civil war. Their most vocal opponent, Jean-Paul Marat, strikes back at the Girondins with furious tirades in his newspaper, naming those he believes are plotting against the revolution. Marat, who once called for the execution of 200, now demands 200,000 heads fall. When you look at Marat's journalism, uh, it's got one basic principle, which is be more extreme than anybody else and call for people to be killed. Um, if you look at Marat's uh, uh, journalism all the time, he's saying, if only we chopped off a few heads, uh, then things will be all right. And when things aren't all right, if only chop off a few more heads, things will be all right. Suddenly, people in Paris begin to massacre people. And Marat is the first to claim credit for that. But the radical movement hasn't taken hold everywhere. People outside of Paris are furious at the spiraling brutality of the Jacobins and call for an end to the bloodletting. And the message reaches the lovely Charlotte Corday, an unassuming yet determined young woman from the provinces. Charlotte Corday is an average person in the city of Caen. She's appalled by the killing that's going on there, and she uh, perhaps rightly, considers uh, Marat one of the chief authors of that. He's been instrumental on the radical side of the revolution. His ami de peuple is still calling for heads. July 13, 1793. Charlotte Corday arrives in Paris. She knows that the friend of the people has an open door policy at his home where he can be found at nearly any hour soaking in his medicinal bath. Corday comes on the pretense that she carries a list of traitors, those collaborating with foreign armies to put an end to the revolution. Marat asks for the list, promising Corday that the traitors will be guillotined the next day. Having given him that, she then produces a poignard, a little stiletto, and stabs him uh, in the chest. The so-called friend of the people dies instantly. The angry voice of his newspaper silenced. When the revolution turns bloodthirsty, it's very easy to say it was his fault. And that, of course, is what those who hated him or feared him did say, and that's one of the reasons why Charlotte Corday actually murders him in 1793, because she regards him as responsible for many of the bloody atrocities that have actually occurred. Corday makes no attempt to escape. At her trial, she is unrepentant. What did you expect to achieve in assassinating Marat? Peace. Now that he's dead, peace will return to my country. Charlotte Corday is swiftly executed, and her dream of peace dies along with her. She has killed Marat the man, but she has created Marat the legend, his death most famously depicted by the revolutionary painter Jacques-Louis David. He became a martyr. He became a kind of almost religious figure. You had people offering up prayers that went, heart of Jesus, heart of Marat. You had these scenes at his funeral where the bathtub in which he was murdered was sort of put up on the altar, almost as if it was a kind of crucifix. If you look at David's painting of Marat's death, 
Marat's body is draped in precisely the same way as the body of Christ is depicted in classic representations of the Pieta, the descent from the cross. So clearly there's an identification of Marat with Christ, with Marat representing the new kind of god of uh, the radical republic. Robespierre is envious of the adoration lavished upon Marat, but ever the pragmatist, he turns his attention to pressing matters at hand. Because though Marat is dead, there are still others calling for blood, royal blood. The Conciergerie, death's dark antechamber. Eight months after the execution of her husband, and just days after the killing of Charlotte Corday, Marie Antoinette is jailed here, in a hideous cell, utterly alone. One of the worst things that happens to Marie after the execution of Louis is her children are ripped away from her. Her children were the most important thing to her, and she knew that, that her son was going to be subjected to terrible abuse to make him forget that he was ever royal by these revolutionaries. And it turns out she was right. It only took a couple of years after that, uh, her son died of terrible neglect and abuse. The once vain Marie Antoinette is 38 years old, but the revolution has aged her beyond her years. Marie Antoinette had been a very pretty woman, elegant, until the revolution. From 1788-89, she got thinner, her hair went white. She abandoned all her coquetry and her pretty things. She became emaciated. When she arrived for her trial, she was unrecognizable. On October 15th, Marie is put on trial accused of high treason and depleting the national treasury. The little evidence offered is salacious and vengeful rumor. A final charge is added to the list. She is accused of incest with her son. At this, Marie stands to defend herself. I appeal to the conscience and feelings of every mother present to declare if there be one amongst you who does not shudder at the idea of such horrors. And at that moment, there was a change in the mood because all the women felt they were implicated and they realized they had gone too far with these accusations. In a moment of public sympathy, Marie hopes she will be deported to Austria, but her hopes are dashed when the sentence is handed down. She is to meet the same fate as her husband. Marie Antoinette was, in a sense, doomed from the start. She was the symbol of this Austrian alliance that had proved disastrous for France. She was, along with her husband, a laughingstock because of the apparent sexual failure of their marriage. And she was a symbol of court culture at a time when people were coming to see the court culture itself as something completely corrupt and terrible for the country. So for all of these reasons, she was hated like no queen of France had ever been hated before. She was loathed, she was reviled. From her cell, Marie writes a final letter, bidding farewell to her children and family, promising to be brave. Her long gray hair is cut in preparation for the blade. are tightly bound. As she is escorted from the prison gates, she expects a carriage. Instead, there awaits a common criminal's cart. She hopes when she's taken off to execution that she's going to get the same treatment that the king got, meaning she would be in an enclosed carriage so that the crowd couldn't get her, but they just put her in an open uh, wagon where people would shout all sorts of things, horrible things, horrible threats at her. A shadow of the sovereign she once was, Marie Antoinette maintains a queenly dignity as she is paraded through the streets of Paris. Her 
name and the charges against her are read out. The last Queen of France is dead. Several days later, following countless more executions, a member of the National Convention notes the pointless waste of life as one after another of his colleagues are lost to the guillotine. The revolution is like Saturn, devouring its own children, he says. Danton sniffs, Revolutions, my friend, cannot be made with rose water. The bloodshed has only just begun. September 1793, four years into the revolution, and France is being torn apart. There is violent insurrection in the provinces, and huge losses in the faltering war against Europe. In one blistering defeat, the British Navy takes the port city of Toulon. Europe is eating away at France's borders. France is the single largest country in Western Europe. It's the most populous country in Western Europe. It has been the great military power. And of course, when it entered into the revolution, a lot of its traditional enemies and also a lot of its traditional allies thought, aha, this is our chance to, not to carve a piece off of the actual territory of France, but certainly to enrich ourselves at its expense and to weaken it permanently. France is isolated in the whole of Europe. It's being blockaded by Britain. It's being attacked and invaded by Austria and by Prussia. The people of Paris are seized by a fear that the victory of the counter-revolution will lead to a bloodbath. Danton and Robespierre, the star orators of the convention, realize that they must boldly strike out to save the revolution. They convince their colleagues to institute a menacing new form of martial law. It is time for all Frenchmen to enjoy sacred equality. It is time to impose this equality by signal acts of justice upon traitors and conspirators. Make terror the order of the day. Thus begins a new chapter in the revolution, a period of violent repression called the Terror. 